Please stand. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for Good Friday is from Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. There I will therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Let us pray. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. St. Paul writes, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him 
who for, who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you willed that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We sing the first verse of the hymn, Jesus, I Will Ponder Now. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, the 18th and 19th chapters. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples ac across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers, from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he, that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant's ear, ser, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me?
So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door, and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went, out, went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him. By your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. My kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose 
I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin." From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified.
Please stand. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Place of a Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold, your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put, a, they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
Please be seated. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. This is the Gospel of of the Lord. Dear Christian friends, learn from Jesus how to live. The Apostle John tells us in the Passion account that Jesus did not consider his own welfare. What does he say that Jesus did? He says that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and notes also 
that his betrayer knew of the place. This shows us that our Lord did not shirk from the evil that was to come upon him. He did not consider his own welfare, and so he went to that place knowing what would happen to him. And consider when he was arrested by the chief priests and the other Jewish religious leaders. He did not, he did not, want, he did not intend to defend himself, but rather he simply spoke the truth. He simply spoke what was true and did not desire to get out of the punishment that was before him. And then consider when he was standing before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Likewise, he did not seek to answer all of the charges that the religious leaders were making against him. And so that Pilate was amazed at Jesus' silence. When Jesus refused to defend himself, Pilate said to him, Do you not know that I have the power to release you or to crucify you? But Jesus knew of power that Pilate could never dream of. You would have no authority except that which is given you from above. And Jesus did not use his own power, but rather submitted to the authority of, of Pontius Pilate and submitted to that crucifixion. In contrast, what did Peter do? Peter denied his Lord. He denied even knowing him. He sought to preserve his life, whereas Jesus Christ sought to give his life. And what do we see with the Jewish religious leaders? They sought to preserve their own power. Jesus sought to give up his power. And what about Pontius Pilate? He sought to preserve his own political skin and to preserve peace. But Jesus, he sought not to preserve his own life, but rather to give his life over. Learn from your Lord in how to live. He submitted to all of this evil because he loved those people and wanted to die for them. And consider from your Lord, as he was hanging on the cross and looking down and seeing there his mother, it must have broken his heart that she had to look up at him in this way. And for him not being able to do anything for her. And yet still caring for her as he always had done. And so the little he could do was to make sure that she would be taken care of. And said to her in regards to the Apostle John, Here is your son and to him here is your mother. In fact, what he most was doing for her was what he was doing for everyone, and that was dying for them. Learn from your Lord in how to live. It is not in seeking, your own, in seeking to preserve your life, but rather in dying. Now it's true that most of us are not called upon in life to make the ultimate sacrifice, that is, to sacrifice our life to save the life of someone else. But you don't have to do that in order to sacrifice your life. Look at the needs of others and count them as more important than your own needs. Look at what will be better for others rather than what is best for yourself. This is how Jesus lived. Of course, he made the ultimate sacrifice, but think about your Lord and the sacrifice he made overall. It was in the incarnation where he chose to give up his glory and be conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And where as he grew, he submitted himself to the authorities that were over him, his parents, his teachers, his elders. And then in his teaching and his, and his ministry, he submitted himself to his heavenly father in serving others and teaching and preaching and healing. But of course, the ultimate sacrifice was that of his suffering and death. Even so, what did people there see as Jesus was on the cross? They saw a criminal between two other criminals who had succumbed 
to the Roman Empire, which had a hold on the entire Western world. What no one there saw was Jesus submitting himself to the Father's wrath. The Father's wrath upon sinners. So look at your life and what do you see? Do you see what Peter and the religious leaders and Pilate saw? Do you see how you need to preserve your own life? Or rather, do you see one who is a sinner? Because that is why Christ died. In fact, Christ, who knows no sin, became sin in our place. That is what Jesus Christ did in his suffering and death. He made the ultimate sacrifice. This is how we learn to live. We learn to live not by preserving our life, but by dying, dying to sin, dying to all that we hold dear. Do you fear, love, and trust in God above all things? Is there envy and anger and lust in your heart? Do you treat the Lord's day as a day in which you need to use to catch up on everything you hadn't gotten done? Or do you die to all of that, counting it all as loss for the surpassing greatness of life in Christ? You are baptized. You are a new creation. You are in Christ, and so your old self is dead. Your new self rises to new life in Christ, in which you are not your own. You belong to him, and in that way you see what a blessing it is, all the many things that God gives to you, including all those in your life, that you may give over your life for them, to serve them and love them. You are in Christ, and you belong to him forever. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Christian church that our Lord God would defend her against all the assaults and temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually on the true foundation, Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in the word of his truth, keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy so that your church spread throughout all the nations may be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all the ministers of the word, for all vocations in the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified. Receive the supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all your servants in your holy church, that every member of the same may truly serve you according to your calling through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our catechumens, that our Lord God would open their hearts in the door of his mercy, that having received the remission of all their sins, by the washing of regeneration, that they may be mindful of their baptism and evermore be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty God and Father, because you always grant growth to your church, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that rejoicing in their new birth by the water of holy baptism, they may forever continue in the family of those whom you adopt as your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. O merciful Father in heaven, because you hold in your hand all the might of man, and because you have ordained for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do well, all the powers that exist in all the nations of the world, 
we humbly pray you graciously to regard your servants, especially our President, the Congress of the United States, our Governor, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws, that all who receive the sword as your ministers may bear it according to your word through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray our Lord God Almighty that he would deliver the world from all error, take away disease, ward off famine, set free those in bondage, and grant health to the sick and a safe journey to all who travel. Almighty and everlasting God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, may the prayers of those who in any tribu tribulation or distress cry to you graciously come before you, so that in all their necessities they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who are outside the church, that our Lord God would be pleased to deliver them from their error, call them to faith in the true and living God and his only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and gather them into his family, the church. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not the death, but the life of all, hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you, Free them from their error and for the glory of your name. Bring them into the fellowship of your holy church through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for peace, that we may come to the knowledge of God's holy word and walk before him as is fitting for Christians. Almighty and everlasting God, King of glory and Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed, by whose providence all things are ordered, the God of peace and the author of all concord. Grant us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and concord, that we may serve you in true fear to the praise and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our enemies, that God would remember them in mercy, and graciously grant them such things as are both needful for them and profitable for their salvation. O Almighty, everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation, all our enemies may be led to true repentance <clears throat> and may have the same love and be of one accord and of one mind and heart with us, with your whole Christian church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the fruits of the earth, that God would send down his blessing upon them and graciously dispose our hearts to enjoy them according to his own good will. O Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you created, and you continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you so to reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his dwelling in our hearts, we may by your grace be made ready to receive your blessing on all the fruits of the earth and whatsoever pertains to our bodily need through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people? And where have I... I offended you. 
Answer me, for I have raised you up out of the prison house of death, of sin and death, and you have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged, for I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross, O my people. Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, leave us not to bitter death. O Lord, have mercy. says the Lord, what have I done to you, O my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have conquered all your foes, and you have given me over and delivered me to those who persecute me. For I have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people. Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, Holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, allow us not to lose hope in the face of death and hell. O Lord, have mercy. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? O my people, is this how you thank your God, O my people? Holy Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal, keep us steadfast in the true faith. O Lord, have mercy.
adore you, O Lord, and we praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For behold, by the wood of your cross, joy has come into all the world. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us and have mercy upon us. We adore you, O Lord, and we praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For behold, by the wood of your cross, joy has come into all the world. Let us pray. We implore you, O Lord, that your abundant blessing may be upon your people who have held the passion and death of your Son in devout remembrance, that we may receive your pardon and the gift of your comfort and may increase in faith and take hold of eternal salvation through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.